Alex asked me to give this, give a nurse project update and uh, just, oh, hang on. It just turned out that uh, the Gig City Elixir posted the nurse project update I did for them like real recently. So um, this is good. This particular YouTube link um, is the talk I gave there. I think it's a little bit more, um, um, I'd say, oriented to some people who don't use the nurse project all that often. And um, so there's a little bit more background. So I figured with this group, I would go a little bit deeper into places. So if I get too deep or it stops making sense, just yell out or type and I'll adjust. So let's see. All right, Zoom, let me click. Um, hang on, everyone. I just need to get rid of some Zoom UI. All right, so I I wanted to just say a couple words about um, because probably people have noticed that I haven't really been active on social media and I missed out on Elixir Comp. So I wanted to make sure everyone knew I still is alive. Um, my company is uh, is keeping me very busy and I've had a lot of travel. Um, and to part of um, what's been going on in my company is we've been deploying a whole lot of devices and I've gotten to be repeatedly nerd sniped and a lot of this stuff I hope to um, to roll back. Some of it's still being rolled out to, you know, in little pieces to, to nerves to make these things easier that we find in production or to see it. But I had one example of being nerd sniped. So if you, you're quick, you can take a screenshot. I don't want to get into this. But like when you start getting tons of devices out, you start seeing weird stuff like this that you just can't debug. Um, because this is a one in um, a big number of devices. But this one I thought I think was one of the funniest ones. If anyone has any clue, I would uh, love to know. So anyway, summary is Unary Plus and uh, um, raising an arithmetic error on, on a what appears to be a number. Anyway, that, that was a unique one. I have, I'm starting to collect a few unique ones that uh, we get. And I hope to share more because they're really super fascinating. Well, anyway, um, moving on, all seriousness. Um, this is, um, so both myself, um, John Carstens, who's also on the Nurse Corps team and also works with me, he's been pretty busy with this too. We were just rolling out lots of devices. And uh, this is really good. This is super exciting for me because I get to debug and get to enhance nerves in some places that you just really don't get to poke into until you get a lot of devices out there and you have appropriate monitoring on those devices to actually see what's happening. So that's been super exciting, but it's also been keeping me a little bit quiet. Um, there's, if you watch the repositories, you'll see like little pieces coming out um, to open to um, from smart run internally to the, um, to the, open source nurse nerve stuff. I'll talk a little bit about that. Some of the pieces hit this talk as to what's new. And uh, um, just in case there's any worries, nerves are totally actively maintained. I get a ton of help from John and Massa and a lot of others. So I know a bunch of other people contribute. And if you watch the repositories, you can see that there's a decent amount of activity, just maybe not on social media or blog posts or talks, conference talks, like, you know, I'd hope to if these were more normal times. All right, so I'm going to go really quick through this. Um, this is, I think we're all on the same page for nerves. Sometimes it gets a little bit confusing because there are an awful lot of libraries on Hex. When I talk about nerves and on this talk on what's new, um, I'm really talking about the core tooling and some of the core libraries that have to do it. And the focus for nerves has always been on, on supporting easy to purchase hardware modulo, you know, easy to purchase um, given, you know, the past several years. Um, NERVS does work. It's really important to emphasize this. NERVS work on, works on a whole lot of devices that companies use and build on. There's some, um, so if you're thinking NERVS is just a Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone thing, or if anyone confronts you and says anything like that, totally not the case. Um, and uh, I'd like to dispel that notion. 
Um, let's see. The only other thing I had on here is firmware distribution. I think the core team gets a little bit more involved because of Nurse Hub. Um, but uh, but this talk, I'm going to be focusing on this area. And I know there are there are other areas. So um, the other point I wanted to make before going into the changes is why we use nerves. And this is kind of my guidepost for, you know, what I want to do with this, this framework. And, and overall, I want to use the beam, right? The beam's the front and center for me. Um, everything's just to make the beam more pleasant to work with and useful and easier for me to get built into projects. Um, and why the beam, it's, it's the ecosystem built around it. And lest anyone worry, um, the NERVS is in production a whole lot of places. I listed a few um, of the industries. Um, this is not, this is, hasn't been a hobby project for a long time for me. And uh, um, while it doesn't fit every embedded use for sure, um, it does fit a lot and it's currently definitely in use. All right, so moving on, I want to make a few points on some of the things we're doing. First, there's this like boring ongoing work and it's not really boring, but I want to share it. Um, it's just stuff that we do all the time, um, just keeping this project fresh and up to date with a lot of the other things going on um, when projects that NERVS uses. Um, the next part, there were a few NERVS projects that went 2.0. I'll mention a little bit about that. OTP 26 had some interesting side effects on us, which actually pushed the next bullet, the NERVS system builder. And this one, um, due to some issues that we had with OTP 26 that affected how people build um, the Linux, Linux pieces or do the port, low level ports, um, NERVS system builder got a little bit more, more use. And it's getting a lot of use, but people don't really know about it. It's been around for a while. I think Alex McLean actually contribute a whole bunch to this. So you get to see a little bit of his work. So I was going to go over a little bit of that just so that everyone could see that there's another way of, of working with nerve systems. And then the last one's this thing's called FWF Ops. It's a little thing, but um, I think it will help. All right. So ongoing... Oh, I see. I already have a question. Um, how, how much is a lot of devices? Yeah, that's... Um, so just to answer the question really quick, when I said that NERVS works on a lot of devices, the baseline is most devices that build root can support, NERVS can support. Um, the. I think NERVS has... Someone has ported NERVS to pretty much every major... Vendor like NXP, Texas Instruments, um, there's all winter ports. I think that the trick with the ports is not so much the core processor, it's the hardware that surrounds it. Um, and that's the that's usually the the peripherals usually make this a little bit more more troublesome. Um the I wish I could categorize a lot because there's so many flavors, and giving you a number would just be terribly misleading. I would I think that the that pretty much any board that has a close to mainline Linux kernel or well-maintained Linux kernel is prop and has 128 megabytes of, of DRAM is probably on the easier side for porting to. There are a couple exceptions there, but uh I think if you have specific questions on that, we can probably or specific boards that you want, I could probably just point out if there's an unofficial board available, or I know of someone who's done it who might be willing to share. So anyway, moving on, um, the build root piece. Um, so build root, this is the nerves use assist to deal with, to build all the Linux stuff. So at the beginning, build root was just used. I really just wanted to use build root for building the Linux kernel, but has this nice, really, side effect that it gives you a backdoor to or or um to being able to pull in random linux things if you happen to be building some piece of software some something that that where there's a off the shelf c or c++ library or application already built and you don't want to rewrite it in in uh 
Elixir. And so get you that. We follow Build Root four releases a year it comes with build root. And so you'll get to see that nerve system VR gets bumped roughly along that, um, cadence, um, modulo, some security patch fixes because the build root pieces tend to be more frequent than the early. Um, so they, it build root ends up driving it. The latest is a uh, build root 20, um, 23, um, 0502. This is not the latest build re release. This is just the latest one that Nerve supports. The very latest one release is 2023.08. That one updates OpenSSL to 3.0. Um, anyone who's done, um, made the migration from OpenSSL 1 um, to 3.0 um, knows that this is either a very easy thing for most of the software or a very hard thing. And there's one hard piece in nerves um, that uh, we're gonna have to contend with. Um, anyone using um, nerves keys, um, ATEC chips to do, to secure connections to, to like AWS IoT or MQTT or nerves hub or anything like that, this open SSL 3.0 updates going to be um, a tiny bit of work, but we'll get through that. So that's probably going to delay us a little bit for that latest update. So hopefully um, no one needs anything super important in that one. All right, so next topic, the Linux kernel. Um, I think everyone knows Nerves runs the Erlang VM on top of the uh, stripped down Linux kernel. So we're we're not talking distros here. We're talking the Linux kernel. And the Linux kernel gives you all the POSIX goodness that you need to run the VM, um, it plus a little bit more. Um, so the for the platforms that we support, try to follow upstream, whatever the board vendor for that, like the Raspberry Pi Foundation, whatever they say that they want to use um and you know by when they say what they want to use it's they've tagged it and it's in raspberry pi os and basically if you had a problem with nerves you could go to the raspberry pi forums ask the question there and hopefully not get the answer that was like oh nerves nerves it's totally different we can't help you um hopefully you can get some semblance of help by you know if you have a linux level question from the upstream providers. So at the moment, um, things are inching towards Linux 6.1. Um, the Raspberry Pi is partially there. 64-bit, um, so nerves on 64-bit Raspberry Pi platforms is on Linux 6.1. It's not yet on the 32-bit Raspberry Pis. Um, so that one's the one that's coming up. There's a hard part about this transition in that uh, Raspberry Pi organization switched how they want to do displays and how they want to do camera inputs. And this was some years ago, and it's been basically getting better and better. Um, we, the Raspberry Pi 4, the nerve support for Raspberry Pi 4 has gone along with this. Lib camera works. The new KMS display should work, or at least works to, to um, um, for for the simple stuff that uh, those of us on the core team test. Um, the 32-bit platforms still use the old MMAL. And the saddest part about using MMAL is, is that the Raspberry Pi, or the, the Elixir camera library for Raspberry Pi, Raspi, the Raspberry Cam library, or, um, is, or the Pi Cam library, sorry, only supports MMAL. So once we make the switch, to lib camera, that library um, no longer is useful. Um, so those of you on the Beagle Bone will notice that we haven't followed there, and that's due to a GPIO numbering issue, which is super annoying. And I can get into that later. Um, and if anyone is interested in helping get past that, help would certainly be be appreciated. It's so anyway. That's the Linux parts. Let's see, um, oops. device support. Um, I had mentioned something a while ago about supporting Beagle Play. 
Beagle Play is such an interesting device. Bits and pieces of it supported. There's no official support in NERVs yet. That's going to have to wait till some more time is available. This is a really neat board, though. So if you haven't taken a look at it, I, I recommend it. Um, we started a uh, Raspberry Pi 0 to W, a 64-bit one. So this is if you want, if you're used to Raspberry Pi 4 and you can, and you start like this, and you like the 64-bit use of Erlang, you can get that on a Raspberry Pi 0 to W or Raspberry Pi 3A using that, uh, that system. This is kind of in the experimental stage. It, it works pretty well. Let's use the Erlang JIT because the Erlang JIT works on ARM64. Um, I think that's by far the most interesting part of it. Um, this one is a total wish list. This is, so if there is an all winner H3 or A64 board, this is like a super fast port for me to be able to push out. Um, I hang on to this. I have, we have this internally. Um, it just needs a little piece of hardware. It's almost works too well to keep keep out of the open source realm, but there's not a good board to target for this that's easily available that I know of. So if that changes, someone ping me if there's interest. Um, the last one I want to talk about, the RISC-64. seems like every day I see another RISC-64 to target. Um, I've, we've circled around the, supporting the Mango Pi for now. Um, there are going to be some interesting updates once we do some once uh, GCC 13 gets into nerves. Um, and then just for, I think, just for the lulls, if you check this this link out, um, that's technically risk 5 So um, I don't really want to get into that too much, but that uh, lets you run nerves in the browser. And uh, so nerves, so Erlang on risk 5 um, in WASM, in a browser. And it actually kind of works. If you have Chrome, it works better. So anyway, um, you'll notice it's Elixir circuit. So so you things partially work. It's kind of unbelievable. So um, I figured I'd share. All right, moving on to the uh, new version of OTP. Um. So I think if you are watching, we told the nerd, we, and that by that I mean nurse core team, we totally got hung up by OTP 26. It took us a long time to support this. Um, I wanted to say one really good thing first, and that's um, interactive mode. So um, we have this decision with nerves where, where we default everyone to use embedded mode. Um, you can change this. So embedded mode versus interactive mode tells the Erlang VM whether it loads all the beam files in your application at boot time or not. So interactive is loads of beam as needed. Embedded is load everything at the beginning and then go. Um, turns out super early on, interactive mode was the way to go. And then we then people start putting Phoenix in their nerves apps. And Phoenix made interactive mode go so slow that it was totally unusable. So we switched to default to embedded mode. Um, and the reason wh why is that uh, every beam file that gets loaded, and there are a whole lot of them, has a penalty associated with it. And the penalty is greater for interactive mode than it is for embedded mode. So that's where I was getting at this death by a thousand cuts. Anyway, Jose, Jose Valin got in there and fixed it. And he, and he has a bunch of, he had a bunch of con contributions to OTP 26 to, to fix this issue. So that um, I think he did for some other reasons, but end up really benefiting nerves and that it's now possible to set interactive mode. And it's not quite as good as embedded mode, but it is really getting close. Um, I think the reason I'm excited about interactive mode is there's some applications like Nerves Live Book that could really benefit by the interactive, that by being able to load um, libraries on demand rather than having to boot and load the world. Um, going on um, the next, um, then the, if for for boot time, this is a complicated subject, but I just want to give everyone the heads up. 
we're probably going to have to address squash FS being a little bit on the slow side for the next set of um, improvements. Um, it's this is totally a death by a thousand cuts issue, um, and there are a couple places to look, but squash FS looks the most promising. Um, okay, the big part was the TTY, and I just want to say I think that there's a lot. Of, it broke a ton. So I just want to say, I really like a lot of the changes to the OTP team. There's no shade on the OTP team. Um, it just took us a long time. And by us, I mean John Karstens, um, because he, I think he fixed every single TTY issue or tracked them down. And I think there's there's still one. Re, um, th there's a system shell that got broke, and that one's a real tough one to fix. Um, but there's one that's still outside, outstanding to the OTP team. But I think, unless you all tell me that there's a new bug on the TTY that we haven't discovered, I think that I think that we're safely on OTP 26. Um, system shell, different story. Um, John put in a workaround so that people could kind of use it. Um, I think you'll see that the workaround is maybe not what everyone would want, but if you're used to using the nerve system shell, you can at least get something working now rather than nothing, which was really not desirable when we updated. All right. So anyway, I'm going to come back to um, the system shell alternative because um, I think that's important for this group. Um, Anyway, that's it on the ongoing stuff. Um, next part, I wanted to switch on like what I've been, I kind of collected these things called the 2.0s. It's kind of like we had all these libraries that we released like years ago. And then through all the use of them, we kind of figured out that they needed, they needed a 2.0 version. There are just some API chain breaking things that we really needed to do. Um, first one, Nerf's Heart. So Nerf's Heart, um is the uh um is the component that basically um pings the Erlang VM needs to ping nerves heart, you know, say that it's okay on a regular basis, or nerves heart kills the Erlang VM and then reboots the device. So it's kind of like um the watchdog for the Erlang VM. Um and what makes nerves heart so different from just a straight Erlang heart is that nurse heart transfers those pings to the to a hardware watchdog. So you have the hardware watchdog and it's well, making sure that the software is okay. The determination that the software is okay is done by nerves heart, which drives its information from Erlang. And you can do some, you can actually put health checks in the Erlang side, the Elixir side to check your application. So this this chain of checking the health of your app can go pretty pretty far, um, but uh, it gets surprisingly complicated. And this and that's not great for um, a piece of software that you kind of are motivated to keep simple um, because um, it's easier to make simple things more robust. So anyway, here's here's the link to the project. The I think the big things, this, there's an API break, but that's not the interesting part. The big things on this were some um, things that happened in um, in production where the initialization and shutdown of the Erlang VM um, got in the way of what Nerves Heart was going to do. So you wanted to have different kind of timeouts, different semantics at the initialization and shutdown than just the same rote Erlang, you know, tell me that you're alive every 30 seconds or whatever it is, and and we're good. So it does that. And then um, this last one, snooze. Um, interesting problems when you go to debug a, a very unhappy system. So as you can imagine, um, systems become unhappy. And sometimes you just want to be like, hang on, give me a little bit more time before you reboot my system. Um, this would be a device in the field. Of course, you could turn nerve start off if you're just doing development and you don't want to deal with it. But you have a device in production someplace remotely, you can be like, I want 10 minutes, you know, snooze me, I want 10 minutes. 
if everything goes wrong, then then the worst I'm out the far is waiting 10 minutes for the reboot to occur. So that's the gist of that. And you can read more about that there. All right. Um, Lixer Circuits. Lixer Circuits 2.0 is out now. Um, it's out and not quite out. So let me just, it's it's out in that it's available. It's not quite out in that there's so many p projects that have dependencies to Elixir Circuits 1.0. You pretty much have to override it, but it's there. It's almost API compatible. Um, and the key thing that we fixed on Elixir Circuits was removing this um, coupling to Linux. And Elixir 1.0 was so effectively hard code to Linux that it actually caused trouble even you know, mocking it. People had to come up with kind of complicated ways are to mock it and substitute out. I think many of you will be familiar with that. And the idea was to better support replacing the back end. And so once we did that, a lot of things became possible. Um, there's um, some of the more fun ones are like for the, this USB to I squared C adapter so that you can just be on your laptop and start uh, sending I squared C commands over to some device and do development locally, which is kind of nice. Um, and I'm skipping fast because I think you all can read, but the 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 other parts that it's just when you can you get the idea when you can substitute the back end, lots of things become possible. And the fun one is the circuit simulator where um, there's a, this library, the circuit sim. So if you go there, you can start it up. Um, you can you can add it as a dependency to your app that you know just for tests and you know have a simulated device and it supports a bunch of them certainly not all and um, as we get through it and add you know necessity means we add we come up with some support for another device we add it um, I feel free to PR if you want to add a device um, but here let me let me just give you a look at how this thing works. So if you just start up circuit sim, just IX-S mix, um, circuits I squared C detect devices. So like, you know, you're just on your laptop, there's nothing real here and bam, you, there's a device that appears. And this one, we just made it up. It's this HT20 device. There's a library for it. I didn't write it, but um, but we can use it anyway. So, so we just, follow the HT20 instructions to start link one. And it of course finds it and it can do stuff, right? So, you know, it's a simulator. So so the 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 measurement, the register values, the I2C register values are, are hard coded in many circumstances for the simulated ones. Some that's fancier so that the, you can tell the simulator what to do. Um, um, certainly I've Certainly wouldn't say that this is a sophisticated simulator, but it's but it's possible. There's a lot of potential here, and I think it can help a bunch of test cases and certainly exploration on some of these devices. So that's that's that. Let's see. Um, good. No comments on that. All right. Hopefully we're doing well because this is probably this nerve system one. This one's a little bit deeper. Um, so I am guessing that this crowd might build more nerve systems than most of the people I talk to. Um, mostly, I mean, this is the hope, right? The hope of nerves is, is that you don't have to deal with the Linux and um, bootloader and all that, all of the C stuff. Um, it's there for you to change, but the hope is, is that you can use what we provide or someone else can do a port or you can do a port at one time and then get in the loop of building of, of um, developing an elixir and mix um, for most of your work. But it's there. And if you and certainly if you're porting to a new board, you're you're going to be in this this area. Um, so there are a couple ways of, of working with systems. The one that we promoted the longest time was using the nerve system shell and using that route of building. Um, that uh, um, um, that broke with OTP 26. It also turns out that all of us on the core team didn't use it. So it was kind of awkward um, because uh, 
um, we'd have a separate, a totally separate way of building, dealing with these systems, mostly tailored to the fact that we just deal with so many nerve systems and um, um, you kind of want to have similar changes applied to each. There's some overlap. Certainly it's nice to like build like 10 of them at a time and then, you know, just go away for lunch and come back because these things take a pretty long time to build. Um, this nerve system project is really close to what I actually do in my daily routine. And I actually use this sometimes, so it's not like I never use this, but it is way close. I just happen to have developed, so just an aside, I've developed a lot of shell scripts. Um, and thanks to Alex, he's weeding me off the shell scripts with this nerve system project. And he's he's like, I'm getting there. Um, so I wanted to show it. Um, the trick here is Linux only. And I have um, the computer I'm on right here. This is an M2 Mac, um, MacBook Pro. Um, I run this um, under UTM, uh, UTM VM, and it runs surprisingly well. Um, like surprisingly well, like it's competitive with my Linux machine. Um, so my x86 Linux machine that I normally do most of my development on. So it's so it's definitely viable to do on Mac under VM. So first of all, if you go to that repository, let me just give you an idea of what the use looks like because um, maybe you don't use this now. Um, since this is recorded, you can go back and kind of see these steps. Um, but I'll try to get you like the high level view um, so that when you actually use it, hopefully it won't feel completely foreign. Um, the star of this, you clone it. It's a mixed project. It has a configuration. Um, mix does mo most of the setup pieces, but you're not constrained to just use mix. You can just dive in to the directories that it builds um, and just use build root and call, type make just directly. So you don't have to wait for a mix to start. You don't have to worry about any Elixir tooling at all. You can just be straight in the build root world. Um, so three things to start out with, and you'll start seeing this on the next page. There's a configuration directory. So config.exs, if you, um, I'll show a little example of what that looks like. Basically says, what, what repositories am I working with? So it knows how to create the, it knows how to get the software for them and, um, and set up the builds. Um, the source directory is not your normal source directory. The source directory contains all the clone repositories. So like if you have nerve system RPI4, say you clone that one, or you want to work with make an RPI4 related project, the source code would be under that source directory. And it would be straight, straight Git repository where you can commit and do everything that you can do with Git, nothing special. This nerve system directory just sets it up for you. Um, the last directory, the O directory, is where all the build output goes. So no build changes to the source directory. It all goes to the output directory. If you've used build root before, um, build root preferentially wants to build to its to an output directory that's separated from the source code directory. You can build in the same directory. They let you do it, but um, happiness is when they're when they're separated. So we do that here too. Okay, um, just key thing, this is development only. Like when you do this in the end, like when you want to distribute the artifact. So in the end, in the nurse project, um, nurse system build cycle, you can build stuff that you can work with, you know, kind of in a development. Um, but then at the end, you'll want to have a tarball that you publish to like GitHub release or something like that, that you still have to use the existing um, um, build system where you go in the nerve system, RPI4, and do um, run the mix commands to build the, art to build the artifact. Um, but you know, CI can do that for you. Like if you copy our CI scripts, it can do that for you. So here's a couple pictures I had. This is kind of like, um, this is the configuration that I have. Um, there's a lot of documentation here, but you know, if you look down like by the arrow, you can see um, 
you can see the little tuples that you set up that say like give a short name and give a um some git url to get the get the source there's some variations on this but um hopefully you get the idea the key is you can have a whole bunch of these so like what you on mine i have a whole bunch and um if i list out my source directory it looks like this um so you can see the mix when when you do mix space ns.clone ns.clone that's inside nerve systems elixir code when you call that it will get clone um it will read the config file and then clone all these source directories and that that's it it's like helpers just think of the elixir stuff as helpers and you'll be okay there's not like rocket science going on in there it's just kind of like getting there are little pieces that just have to be coordinated so i just did another screenshot just to kind of show that there's no magic that these are regular git repositories um after you've done mix ns.clone you can build and this i just took a screenshot because this like takes forever especially since i have like 10 or 15 configurations you just let the laptop you know loose overnight and it can have everything built and the nice part is when you get back to it everything's built you can do incremental builds after that so um here's so after everything's built this is kind of like the part where you just wait and like come back um or maybe you only have one um one nerve system at a time um what what you do is you go to the o directory the output directory and then you can just type make and of course they build or you can do make menu config and you get the nice little ascii uh, menu on the right that if you use build root you know and love and you can add change options add new packages do whatever um you can do make linux menu config make uboot menu config you name it all the build root things totally available you're in build root land no elixir stuff around when you start working in that o directory um and uh yeah so the last one i wrote down is make save def config and make save def config saves whatever your configuration is over to the source directory it's like build root it's a total build root helper all this stuff is just standard build root um so just to back up nerve systems set you up now we're in build root land um so when you type make looks like this i didn't again i screenshot it because live coding this would be incredibly boring um so this i just cd to o slash um mango pi mq pro type make and this is the end of you know this is the end, this is what the last part of the build root output looks like um nothing really fancy to see here if you've ever built a system this hopefully will be familiar so then the, then the next part and this is the important part is how do you use what you just built and this is the magic there's a shell script in that directory um and i don't have an arrow to point to it but it's um nerves dash env dot sh you source it and it sets up your environment it sets so many variables like your environment is totally destroyed with environment variables so this is a very special environment um the environment variables are critical for crop doing the cross compilation so you source it and then you go over to wherever your mix project is that has your your nurse project in it like this one i just went over to the circuits quick start source director because i use it a lot and then you can just type mix firmware and it will use the thing that you built it will use the tool chain everything everything just like you built it over there um and i guess i pointed out this is straight mix firmware environment variables changed um the fact that all um the build process in all the right places to do appropriate cross compilation do the whole thing and so mix firmware upload and it just works everything's the normal way hopefully that makes sense to people um you know this is part where it's going to hope to look for our heads um either confused or not but 
now I realize I can just see Alex's head. And Alex, I know, is not confused because he wrote this. <laughs> he wrote a whole lot of this. So um, one thing um, that will help many of you out a ton, you don't have to always do mixed firmware and upgrade. You can just SFTP over binaries. So here's an example. I just want to use strace. So I go through make menu config, turn on strace. And there are a whole lot of Linux programs that literally just result in one binary. So this is kind of one of those things that works for the one binary case. If you're dealing with a whole bunch of shared libraries, then, then uh, you have to be a little bit more clever with um, setting up SO library path. But here's, here's what I do with SFTP. I build it. So, so you see, I went back and typed make in the build section in that O directory. Type make, it built everything. The strace binary is in the target um, user bin strace directory. So there's a target directory that has everything that uh, build root built. Um, and so hopefully you can see where in here where I SFTP'd the one night. Um, I wish I could have the arrow. Uh, midway down, SFTP to the IP address of, of my mango pie. And then, um, well, I try, I sadly tried to do a tab complete the first time I called SFTP. And then it it advanced to putting the strace binary in, and I put in the slash root directory. So once it's in the slash root directory, hopefully that makes sense. You can just go over to the IX prompt on the device, on the mango pie, change its permissions um, so that it's executable, and then you can run it. So if you ever need to run strace, just copy it over, 777 it, chmod 777 it, and then you can run it. So sometimes that comes in handy. Um, this works for a lot of things. So so don't forget about, like the summer here is don't forget about SFTP because uh, the development cycle time can be a lot faster. In fact, you can even have like an SFTP window open and kind of automate this a little bit about putting new binaries in then and retry them. And if you're doing, making C changes, it's not the perfect C environment, but it's way better than uploading firmware every single time. All right, let's see. So that's the systems. So the last thing that I want to say that was new is this FWF ops. Um, don't see any questions. Well, hopefully you all followed that um, or came close to where it's good enough to try. So anyway, this last part, the FWF ops. Um, oops, that animation wasn't supposed to happen. So the I want to just level set with what FWUP is. So um, FWUP is the firmware update system that, that NERVS uses. And NERVS, for pretty much every platform, uses AB updates. So there's there's um, on the micro SD card or on the EMMC, um, there's a little place for one firmware, a second place for a second firmware, and then a big spot for all of your application data. And then there's a little flag and depending on the system, it's in different places for whether it should use the first slot, the A slot, or the B slot to run. And the way it works is you keep on flip-flopping between A and B. You run A, firmware update to B, switch over to B. Um, if you're with a little bit of effort, you can have it. So if you try B and B doesn't work, you can fail back to A. Um, the other nice things that happen if you're updating B, you know, if you're running out of A, your update's going on, someone pulls the power, something terrible happens, you haven't lost anything, the next boot will continue to go out of A. So it's, it's kind of an easy way of, of adding a little bit of resiliency to firmware updates, especially since uh, file system storage um, is, is uh, relatively large compared to the firmware update size, especially the, the nerves ones. So anyway, you go back and forth. Um, that's what FWF does. So um, just to review, there are two main tasks. So FWF has this concept called tasks. And when you give it a .fw file, 
it runs that .fw file has information on how to write that micro SD card, and it can have multiple of these instruction sets, and each one of those is called a task. And the convention with NERVs is to call the the one task the complete task. The complete tasks overwrites everything. This is your factory image. Um, you're using it if you do mix firmware.burn. That's the one that you're using. You know, you get like an SD card with one in, one firmware image on it and a totally blank application data partition. And like what makes firmware.image, this one creates the actual binary file that you could give to uh, um, the duplicate or an EMMC duplicator programmer to do these in bulk. Um, the other main task is the upgrade task. So when you upgrade over SSH, or when you send a firmware update over SSH, it's invoking the upgrade task in the .fw file. An upgrade task basically says, am I running from partition A? If so, then update B. And then when I'm done updating B, then switch the flag to say boot, from, boot to B, you know, after I'm totally done. That's like the high level. Um, the, uh, oh, let's see, I think that's, so those are the two. So there's another thing which has been hidden in there. Um, in the, in the nerves images that are currently made, the, um, there's a file under user shared FW up for most systems it's been called revert.fw. Um, it's been renamed to ops.fw, but that the renaming doesn't matter. It doesn't affect you, but that's a little tiny firmware file that contains instructions. Um, so um, the purpose of that file is that FW, the FW up program knows how to manipulate the, your, the micro SD card and the, or the EMMC at a low level. And it, it has a lot of smarts um, at, at doing this. And it's also a very convenient place because you know where the different byte offsets are. There's a lot of information that FWF just knows. So it kind of makes sense to also use it to handle other tasks. And the main other task is reverting. So there's in this user share FWF ops.fw, it has a revert task. And this is at runtime. So, um, and all it knows, it, it just says, is the opposite partition a good firmware partition to go back to? Yes, switch the boot flag to go back to that. So if you actually look at this file or look at the revert.fw file, you'll see it's really small because it has like no data, it just has instructions. So that's the key thing. Um, the Where we've taken this is we've added more tasks. So in addition to the revert, um, there are a few of these, up, and you can kind of read these, but I think some of the important part is maybe the intention behind them. So um, like prevent revert. So the prevent revert is some people have like a manufacturing task. So if you build a whole bunch of devices, you put a manufacturing program on the device, but you totally don't want that one to be out in the wild at all. Once the first software load goes on, you can prevent re revert, prevent revert, revert, just clears out that previous partition. So if that manufacturing program has like secret keys or just anything that you just don't want out um, um, at rest in public or on your device after it's shipped, that's there to do that. Um, the factory reset one is kind of an interesting one because how do you get a device back to pristine condition? And um, one way of doing this is that is to store all of your settings. So factory defaults is no settings, right? So store all of your settings on the application data partition and all your data. So, you know, factory clean device has nothing on application data. So, so just call that factory defaults. So how do you get things back to factory defaults? Well, the easiest way is just to totally wipe out the application data partition at such a low level that it gets totally reformatted. So totally cleans out the bytes. Um, then the question is, how can you be so, how can you be thorough about that? 
right? So one way of doing this would be to rm-fr star the, the application data partition. But if you really want to be specific at this, wouldn't it be better just to reformat the whole thing so that the bits are all the original bit away? And that's the factory reset uh, task. Uh, you'll find this on a bunch of um, nerf systems, but it's uh, it's not on all of them. So if you get an error um, when trying to run these, that might be why. And it's not a big effort to put them on there. It's just a little bit of effort. So to make this easier, there are some helpers. These just got introduced really recently in NERVS runtime. Um, they're in the FWF ops uh, module. Um, I view these as all incredibly dangerous and, and they're so dangerous. I'm kind of wondering like, you know, if we'll need a little bit more protection around them to prevent, prevent accidentally calling factory reset or, um, but, uh, you know, even internally at, at smart rent, we have, we sometimes have like, um, specific arguments that we pass this stuff. So someone doesn't accidentally tap complete fat finger enter and do a factory reset on some device that's Toll, that's totally somewhere in the field that is like really brutal to get to. Um, but it's there. Um, use it with care. Uh, more information is on this. All right. So, all right. That's really, that's really the new stuff um, that I wanted to go over for this call. Um, I wanted to also give a heads up for what to watch. And one of the things I'm very excited about because it benefits me a lot is um, is ARM32 JIT. Um, I have a lot of ARM32 devices out there. Getting the JIT on another platform is is beneficial. Personally, it also is, I think it also leads the direction to getting the Erlang JIT on some other devices. I think it will open up Risk Five as well, which will be exciting. Um, if you want to follow that along, um, join the Erlang ecosystem and the embedded working group and you can get updates this was a really big um funding that the erlang ecosystem did so um anyone out there who helps out with the erlang ecosystem or um thank you very much um this is this is not something that uh that ericsson was going to be able to take on themselves so it's very nice to see this work starting the uh, other thing, this is totally minor, but there's going to be more um, message of the day. So there's my D. You always see that coming up. This is like a little favorite piece. Um, I don't want to give it away because it's a total vaporware until it's not. Um, but uh, um, Massa has been cooking up some updates to Nurse my D and probably when, by the, hopefully by the time this one hits the internet, um, it uh, some of those can be shared more. Um, see um nerves heart believe it or not there's more um and once you start using nerves heart in a you know a project that really needs to be monitored you start diving into well, like what goes into all the health checks how the health checks work so so like how do i know my application is like in a good shape and the worst part about checking that an application is in good shape is that if your check is not totally robust, your application can be in worse shape because it can like trigger like the, the um, nurse heart um, to think that there's a failure in Erlang and cause a reboot. Um, this has been hard earned, hard learned. Um, it's been a very interesting process. So the and is definitely something that's much harder than it looks on the outside. So um, I am very much hoping to push some of the improvements that we've made internally um, to out to the OSS world so that there can be a little bit more sanity in how you hook things up um, in this area. Uh, oops, I hit done twice, but uh, risk five. So the neat thing is, is that there are people um, Unnamed, um, looking into lots of, there are quite a few people looking into risk five things. Um, and GCC 13 has 
seems like it might be unblocking another set of things with risk five. So I am hopeful to see more about this. And um, this has just been exciting. You know, risk five has just been very innovative on some fronts. So I'm kind of excited to see NERST be able to participate in some of this. Um, machine learning. Um, I have nothing to report. Um, there's just like continuous progress at the low levels. And um, um, Coco, um, if you follow Coco at all um, with uh, eVision and the other projects, you'll see that they have lots of stuff working. Um, there is definitely more work in this area till I think it's generally a lot of the, in, until I think a lot of the stuff that's available in NX is generally use, useful on Embedded. Um, it's useful with work right now, um, but uh, I'd love it to be something that could be plugged in as simply as um, many of Jose's demos. So I am hopeful that as things progress that eventually get to where we can have some good off the shelf demos that don't require a ton of work. And the last thing I want to point out was Codebeam America seems like some to go um, that this, this might have their presence. And I wanted to start getting this on people's calendars. I um, to I just got uh, my internet connection is unstable, but this is close to my last slide. So hope um you all heard heard most of the rest. um but anyway i'm i'm planning on going there i said uh, uh a few more of us can that would be cool um, to see one that plan and, and with that i have some, i'm open to questions i'll take another look at the chat um frank you started breaking up there a bit where you were mentioning uh code beam but um if i got the the gist of it for everybody it's that uh nerves presence at code beam so if you're interested in nerves things and hanging out with people go to code beam so basically the gist yes that's what i'm going to say so let me also make it so everybody can uh unmute and feel free to ask frank questions um, alfonso says what about nerves compatibility with yocto oh yes yes um Nerves, I would say nerves compatibility with Yocto is look at Yocto and try to extract the Linux build commands and then move them to build root um, because it will build way faster and be a lot easier to maintain. I realize that's kind of a total cop out, but um, I think Yocto is very good for getting instructions for, um, you know, since since some vendors prefer Yocto, but I, I would Yes, I guess your situation, I think I might know a little bit more from some other questions you've asked me in the past. Um, I think we might, I, I, I'm tr trying to think of a good route for you. The, the route for me that I always take is to extract from Yocto what's needed. Um, I don't, while there are a lot of good things about Yocto, I don't, really expect to spend time on making nerves compatible to, with it got another one from the chat uh any news about nerve sub oh nerve sub 2.0 yeah so um you actually so so there was recently a talk on that i think what two months ago yeah yeah so nurse hub 2.0 is live and kicking and um it's kind of cool um Please take a second look um, at it. I think um, if I were to pick out a couple things about Nerf Sub 2.0 compared to Nerf Sub 1.0, which was um, which had a lot of publicity, you know, some years ago, um, 2.0 is um, a little bit easier to set up, um, and it strips out a lot of functionality that. Uh, that in retrospect isn't used, which made it a little bit easier to maintain. Um, we use NERSUB 2.0 at SmartRent um, all the time. It works extremely well. 
and uh, we're shipping back all of our changes OSF to open source world on it. Um, I think that the the biggest th hurdle that everyone has to get over is that original setup and um, then possibly get into some routine to um, accept updates, you know, resync with what's going on on GitHub because you'll see features coming in. Yeah, I dropped a link to Nerve Sub 2.0, the talk from the meetup in the chat there too. Right, so right. anyone who wants to see that, yeah, go ahead. It's improved exactly. since that talk. It, I mean, it's it's totally fun. Like Eric added a chat feature. A lot of us use it. So I think many of you know about Nerve Sub, um, how there's a common, um, so you can log in and get the IEX prompt, right? On a device anywhere. And, uh, um, and sometimes we've had pair debug of devices in the field and he just added a chat box which turned out to be surprisingly helpful and useful so it's it, you never know it's it it's just been a fun project um and um yeah probably worth another talk maybe in you know whatever the appropriate amount of time is that goes by for these things jason um Axelson, you asked about how you run the uh, FW ops, up ops tasks. Did I answer yeah. that with the use nurse runtime? Yeah, yeah, I was on the next slide. Yeah. This wasn't yeah, sure. Cool. <laughs> um, if you look at the implementation, um, it's um, the wrapper from nurse runtime um, basically compiles down to a very simple command line to the FW up utility. So. Ah, uh, nice. Yeah, it's not it's not mm -hmm. rocket science in that project. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, a related thing I was wondering is: is there an easy way to like stash a known good piece of firmware? Like, if you have like, I mean, sometimes I'm like updating, I'm pushing a bunch of changes, but then I realize that okay, like most of my changes these today have been like broken. I want to go back to what I had before, but like I have multiple different their repositories and working on locally. Yeah, yeah, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get what you're doing. We so um this is where I really want to get out of the box the automatic revert, but uh um that saves a lot of the motivation. But there's like another setup that you could have is you could have three firmware blocks, right? You're thinking about doing mm -hmm. A B and then having the known good one and then be like just FW up, switch me to boot let's call it C, the known good one. Um, that is, that requires some nerve system work, but FW mm -hmm. totally can do this. Um, I think you've used the FW up comp a little bit. To, <laughs> yeah. um, I think that I'd add another task that, that could write the known good one. And then, um, hmm. Um, possibly have a test to, to force the known good. Um, if you want to automate it, then you have to hook into the bootloader to do something. But but if all you if you just want to force it, then um, you might be able to um, copy paste some stuff from the FW up ops and and copy paste to um, maybe part of the complete task to write it the first time. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I'll take a look at it. Thank you. I've been in some chats and I've been trying to get the last little hurdle for near sub 2.0 out of our way. And the only thing I can think of, I, I thought I could just do it with a, uh, like, you know, uh, forward the certificate as a header, except that the fact that the certificate is loaded through web sockets and so complicated in like, say, a plug solution. So I'm, I'm like, all I can really do is like, uh, Maybe sneak the headers in, or um, I, I don't. I don't. Under, I don't know anything about HA proxy. So, like the Eric's suggestion in the Slack kind of was lost on me. <laughs> like... uh, um, yeah. It, I'm sorry. It's lost. This is not my. Domain no, it's not. It's, yeah, it's not your worth. It, it um, was something that. that uh, anyway, it, like I, I, if if I could get past that, I'd I'd actually be like ready to go uh, and probably push out our few. Uh, um, deployments uh, into a proper uh, nurse have a, uh, uh, arrangement, but I, I haven't been able to get there yet. <laughs> so yeah. It looks cool. Uh, I just haven't been able to get it to work. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I, I think the 
if I know that there are a lot of different ways of setting up servers um, with Nurse yeah. Hub, and I think Eric, John, try to support the one that you know that's closest and simplest to the one that we do. Um, I don't know if they can give any more hints or others on this call, or we have set up Nurse Hub 2.0. Maybe we could get some more docs in your area. I just really can't answer your question without. No, it's help. all right. That, that's that's it's just comment. I, I I didn't expect it to magically be solvable here. So. Yeah, I, I think uh, the, one of the challenges is, of course, you probably don't necessarily like the nurse hub folks probably don't want to have full details about, and they're not using nurse hub two point themselves yet. So, uh, yep, we use it. So I think our problem is is that we have we have a couple setups. Um, the one that we use at SmartRent um, uses. We have a lot of we have a pretty complicated setup at Smart Run because we have a whole lot of devices connecting to it, and yeah. that's not the easiest one to share outside yeah. of um, it, the and then the other setup that we that's easiest to share is the I have one server and here's how I set it up and hopefully that will scale to your you know hundreds or well, that, I mean honestly that would be fine for now just that the one server thing with the uh, with caddy um doesn't work uh like it, mm -hmm. devices can't connect because uh caddy intercepts the the um uh the certificate negotiation yeah yeah I get uh, it and yeah. and there's some needs to get the certs to off yeah. it yeah I um, there must be some solution. I just don't. I don't. I don't know what I'm yeah, doing. Yeah. So I, 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 I don't know anything about. Like, I, I kind of. I don't know if I even would be able to make this work in, in like uh, Nginx because I don't think it's like a the sweet spot either yeah. for that. But uh, uh, the 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 uh, reverse proxy stuff that I know how to set up is all Nginx focused. So, gotcha. Well, it looks like John's trying to help async oh, in the chat and maybe. We can move that okay, to yeah. some Yeah, sorry, place. it's too much for... <laughs> I mean, one thing that I'd ask of people is just, just a, like, are there um, areas of of nerves that would be, would be super helpful for the core team to be aware of to prioritize and work um, as, uh, you know, as time permits? Um, or maybe someone else could also help submit to this um you know we're we have a lot, lot of we have a lot of tests that we have driven from stuff that we see and stuff that our companies uh instigate for sure but uh i always like hearing like where people are looking i can mention one me as more or less backend developer trying to get into the embedded i really yep. struggle i really struggle a lot with um building let's say um a system which is based let's say on raspberry image but i have a few peripheral devices around which i need to include through the device trees and going through the documentation i kind of struggle because either it's not too uh detailed yeah, well, for me or something like that because i I'm I mean, it's there. not document. So, so what you're talking about are the device trees, um, and the Raspberry Pi Foundation doesn't document what their bootloader does. Um, it's a struggle for for me too. I think the only thing is is, is uh, perseverance on trying out a whole lot of things until one thing works. Um, they do have some. There is some documentation in the Raspberry Pi docs on the device trees, but uh, they do the the trick, um, the Raspberry Pi's closed source bootloader does set and load device tree overlays with the piece of logic that's inside of it that's hard to see. And the only way I've seen to deal with that is to, to boot up Raspberry Pi OS dump the device tree and then see what pieces are missing. So dumping the device tree, you can see what it looks like under um, um, under slash proc um, and uh, um, compare that with what you see under um, doing the same thing with the nerves booting 
I don't think this is going to be super helpful to you because device tree dumping these device trees is kind of complicated. Um, but maybe with some perseverance, um, or maybe posting which particular de um, device you're looking at integrating, maybe you guess some hints or get some people who've done this before to guess some hints to help you with which device tree overlay files are needed or what config.txt is needed. I've been helping Tomash a bit and actually something yeah. that comes to mind because um, I think a, a big chunk of this question is driven from how do you understand how to build a nerve system in the first place and know yeah. that you're doing the right thing and actually get it working. And uh, one of the things that comes to mind is, is something that someone once told me for learning how to build nerve systems. And that's, um, well, first of all, the, based on what Frank just said, the Raspberry Pi is probably a hard one to start with, um, but it was go with an off the shelf uh, official nerve system that already exists. So I went with the Beagle Bone. Uh, that one actually uses device tree and TI is very open about having all the stuff for that public. And uh, Cake, like Frank mentioned earlier in this talk, uh, those those vendors publish their Linux kernel. Um, typically, they have it in a repo somewhere. So TI has one in a there isn't a GitHub repo. Take that and take build root and get that bootstrapping nerves, basically. And so you can kind of work, uh, you can work the exercise forward from how you're building the system up, but you have an existing nerves system already for that as a cheat sheet to make sure you're headed in the right direction. And if you get stuck, you can look at the official nerve system to see how things were supposed to get glued together if that makes any sense. So you kind of take the individual components, start wiring them together. And, and if you get stuck, go look at the official nerve system that already did it to, uh, to help you out to figure out what you're missing. Yeah, there are definitely some easier boards than other boards. It's it's almost ironic that the Raspberry Pi is not easier. Um, it's easy in so many things, but this one particular area, it's a little bit challenging. Um, and BeagleBone is probably one of the best boards that I can think of. Maybe uh, an STM32 um, MP1 might be a, a good one as well. That's a little bit newer, but um, that one, the NERF systems, the OSD32 MP1 um, system. Um, but the But yeah, choosing a board to start out with on this stuff can really be, be a big difference. What should be your favorite board in terms of POCs, building POCs or general purpose? Um, so I the question was, what's my favorite board for building PLCs or? Yeah, like building or, just like or that, kind, that kind of stuff. New... I mean, there are a lot. Yeah, like... There's a lot that goes into this. I mean, I'm a big fan of the Beagle board, um, the AM3358. It's an old CPU, but I'm and it has a couple big challenges. But that one's one of my favorites in just terms of understanding every, being able to understand every part of it, and having documentation and having the core Linux kernel, um. Um, being super mature for it and no surprises, which, um, let's see. I see you shared a link. I'm looking at it now. Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and ESP32. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, it's cool. Uh, I, I still would go with that. I, I am a very happy AM3358 user. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Alex, do you have opinions on this? Um, well, I, um, I I probably shouldn't say this because it's the the work you were trying to dodge in the the presentation there. Uh, but that um, AM sixty two chip that the oh, yeah. play is based on, that thing has a secure zone yes. around that M zero processor. That might make a really nice industrial controller. Yeah, I if you need this, th that that's the one downside to the AM thirty three fifty eight is is the lack of the uh, the secure zone. Um, insecure boot. Um, so if you need that, then, then, well, that's not an option. The other thing 
is that which which processors are the ones that I can buy in bulk, which for better or worse, that's been a, a determiner of what I can do on on a few products. I'm intrigued by all your Raspberry Pi PLC links. Yeah. I, Unfortunately, or around the Raspberry Pi. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to knock the... Once you get past the porting part of the software, um, Raspberry Pi is kind of nice because there's a lot of support for it. Um, I, I would also point out to look at some of these other processors have some built-in IOs that are pretty convenient to use. Like, so Raspberry Pi, you have to go through the shield to get to everything. And you might have to go through some other chips, but sometimes it's nice just to have, you know, about, you know, five or six UARTs um, just coming straight from the main process, main SOC without having to go through any uh, conversion between like USB to UART or any anything else. And that's, I think that's what, what would you get be, with some of the other processors. Frank, what would be the, the, the board that you would suggest for an industrial usage? Um, I currently work with electrical engineer to design the boards. So I'm not sure that I'm the, uh, the right recommender on some of these things like the, uh, for our, for, for what, my company does the low volume boards. We um, we go with um, a more prepackaged solution. So, like the company Octavo, um, they package like the AM thirty three fifty eight in a very um, with all the little peripherals and the high speed stuff all in one big chip. So, if you look at them, you can get an idea of one way. But if you go with like NXP, they'll give you like a little. Um, there are companies that make these little sim-like modules or things with little connectors, you know, kind of like the Raspberry Pi compute module that plug in. We tip, we typically would go with something like that. And the uh, the Octavo package just happens to be easy for us. So um, I I don't feel restricted to buying somebody's off-the-shelf solution for this. Um, maybe others have recommendations for going that route, though. There's another question on here. Smallest device on which nerves can run. Um, this one heavily has to do with how much work you want to put in. I like John's answer. Because you're gonna you almost tricked me into talking about uh getting nerves on on um um I'm drawing a blank on the name, but all winter has these really small chips that you can that are that almost have pins coming out that you can solder down that can run Linux and nerves can technically run on that, but it's a real, it's not a fun environment. So, um, I, my view is that under 128 megabytes of DRAM, um, is not fun, um, for using nerves. And it's not that nerves uses all that much. It's just that, um, you can be lazy and, get away with it. And um, I prefer being lazy if I can. And some of those really small processors, um, small, they have like 32 megabytes of DRAM and that that forces work. And unless you're willing to do, I think, I think it's possible, but it's like one of those things, like it would be totally not fun and you'd be spending a ton of time getting it to work. And it'd probably end up being slow. And for the recording, John's answer was the Pocket Beagle or the Raspberry Pi Zero are probably the smallest physical form yes. factor for officially supported devices. Um, yes. Though the the constraints probably whether or not you can run uh, what you can run the Linux kernel on, like what Frank said earlier in the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the Linux can, kernel can technically run without an MMU. Um, you can do that, but don't do that. I, Nerves doesn't support you without. Um, with no MMU Linux. Hopefully that answers it. Well, cool. Thanks for everyone for showing up today and uh, listening to Frank talk about what's new with Nerve, uh, with um, Nerves. Almost said Nerves Hub there. <laughs> <laughs>